So good morning, everyone. If you're just uh, entering the chat room, we're going to give it a few minutes where others can join in. I see we already have over 80 participants on the call, so we'll just give it another minute or so and we'll get started. Great. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar today with a really special guest, uh, Congressman Troy Balderson. Um, we're going to be able to talk to him a little bit about the impact of COVID-19 on child care in Ohio. Uh, I'm Shannon Jones. I'm the Executive Director of Groundwork Ohio. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Groundwork Ohio is a nonpartisan policy and advocacy organization that really champions high quality early learning and healthy development strategies from the prenatal period to age five. We know that these types of policies and investments lay a strong foundation for not only our kids and the families that support them, but also our communities and our economy. Um, our special guest today, as I mentioned, is Congressman Troy Balderson. Uh, you all probably know him as the representative from Ohio's 12th Congressional District. He's been serving in this role since 2018, and that district includes Delaware, Morrow, and Licking Counties, along with parts of Franklin, Marion, Muskingum, and Richland Counties. He serves on the Small Business Committee and its Innovation and Workforce Subcommittee, and I had the pleasure of serving with him in the Ohio General Assembly from 2009 um, to 2018. So we are excited to welcome him um, to our discussion today. Um, before we turn it over to the panel, um, we thought, Congressman, that we would just do a little level setting um, to set the stage for the conversation. So you really understand um, at a state level what's been happening in the childcare world since um, the beginning of COVID-19. Um, back on March 26th, all childcare programs were forced to close unless they were operating under a temporary pandemic childcare license. So this was a specific license that was obviously instituted as a result of COVID, understanding that there are essential workers who needed childcare for their families in order to be able to do those essential services. So there were over 2,200 pandemic childcare providers that were operating during this key time of the pandemic serving about 25,000 children during this closure period. So the way that the state supported um, not only the pandemic providers, but also as we enter in this reopening stage, about half of the CARES dollars that um, the, the Congress sent to the state, which as you may know, as you probably remember, three and a half billion dollars in the first CARES Act went through the um, Child Care Development Block Grant. Um, and for Ohio, that was about $120 million. So that 60 million of that 120 million was used to pay for that pandemic child care. So it was supporting the child care um, programs uh, uh, during that very specific period of time for essential workers. The other um, 60 million has been used in grants for um, starting up uh, or restarting child care. So, you know, the child care programs starting on May 31st were able to reopen in the state, but they were required to do so under uh, new regulations, which included um, smaller classroom sizes, smaller uh, teacher to child ratios and as well as you know enhanced cleaning and other safety measures that really um, has put 
a tremendous burden on uh, child care providers because it really has meant that the financial model for child care no longer works. So that's where that other $60 million has come in um, through these grants. Um, it supports both publicly funded and private child care. Um, we know, however, that in the near two months that uh, child care has been uh, reopened, certainly not all programs are reopened, but those uh, dollars from the CARES Act will be exhausted by the end of this month. So um, we have a lot of people who are very concerned, uh, parents who are relying on childcare, providers who are providing the childcare, teachers who are teaching in the childcare setting, uh, not to mention the businesses who depend on their workforce getting quality childcare. So that's really providing the basis of our conversation today. Next slide. So, when you think about how um, childcare will be impacted moving forward, national estimates tell us that 45% of our childcare capacity will be lost in Ohio without a lot of advocacy and intervention and frankly, investment. And so we're very concerned about how um, we're not only going to sustain childcare, but also as businesses continue to um, open up, that we'll have the, the kind of childcare capacity that we need. So Ohio has immediate need for investment of 50 billion of, of um, new resources coming into the state, which is why we're, we've been talking to, to you and your colleagues, and I know you've re been receiving letters and emails from your constituents um, looking for support of $50 billion in dedicated flexible funds through CCDBG. Of that $50 billion, we estimate that Ohio would get um, about $1.67 billion to support the rebuilding and the sustaining of the children, families, and the child care providers. That's our immediate need. So today, I, I really want you to hear from the experts in the field. We have a really great panel today. Kimberly Tice, she's the executive director of the Ohio AEYC. Um, the Ohio AEYC is really focused on, and, and they are the association that supports the teachers in, and professionals in the classrooms. Eric Krolik, who is the CEO of Action for Children, and they are the child care resource and referral um, agency that supports your constituents in your district. And uh, Leanne Easterling, you get to hear um, from a provider in your community. She's the director of the Mary Evans Child Development Center. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kim Tice to start us off in the conversation and share a little bit with us, Kim, if you would, um, how this pandemic period of time has impacted the child care providers that you represent. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share our concerns with you, Congressman Balderson. I live in the small town of Mount Gilead, Ohio, in your district, and our parent organization, NACI, recently completed a national survey that revealed that child care is really in a fight for its very survival. I'm planning to share highlights of this survey as it represents the voices of the providers who are working on the front lines. So our nation's children, the families, the early childhood educators and their businesses have long been denied the public investment necessary to ensure a thriving child care system. The lack of sufficient public investment in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic has really forced families and educators and childcare programs into just a series of impossible choices with really devastating consequences to themselves professionally and the small businesses that they operate. So in telling their stories, 
these child care providers have really made it clear that they're doing everything they can to hold their programs together. We're hearing that they're scrimping, they're spending down savings, and they're even using their own personal funds to try to keep their programs afloat. So the survey results show that if help doesn't come and it doesn't come soon, there's really gonna be very little left of childcare to save. The most alarming result from the survey on a national level is that only 18% of programs are confident that they would be able to stay open past one year without an additional investment. But I'd also like to share with you a few of the findings that are Ohio based. And we will be getting a full state by state survey result report from NAYC shortly. But in Ohio, without additional public investment, 48% of childcare programs are certain that they will close permanently. Of the childcare programs who said they were minority owned, the percentage who are certain that, certain that they would close permanently rises to 60%. And 46% of programs said they received the payroll or the paycheck protection program. However, there was real variation based on the program size and the program setting. Only 9% of family child care homes reported receiving PPP. 15% of small child care centers received PPP, while 67% of large child care centers received PPP. And finally, only 36% of minority owned child care businesses in Ohio said they received the PPP loan. So child, the whole child care sector, and these are people who are in your district, many of them are on this call who have been talking with us since this began. They're just really, it's approaching a catastrophic situation. And these providers are really they're stepping to the plate where they're determined to figure out a way to make this work. But at the very same time, they're weary and they're skeptical. And to be honest, they're very scared of what the future holds for them. So Ohio AEYC and our members really encourage Congress to provide the needed additional investment that Shannon spoke about in her PowerPoint presentation. We believe that this essential child care workforce needs this so they can continue to support children, families, and the American economy through this crisis and beyond. Thank you for listening to our concerns, Congresswoman Balderman, Balderson. Thank you, Kim. Um, I really appreciate you lifting up the top lines on uh, that NACI survey. And for those of you who are on the webinar, um, a link has been put into the chat box um, if you wanna take a look at that uh, survey in, in more detail. But with those comments, um, sort of as, as a background, I'm wondering, Eric, if I can turn it over to you to talk a little bit from the systems level in how you're dealing with the providers and the families in the communities you're serving. Thanks, Shannon. And thank you, Congressman Balderson, for making the time for this uh, issue that I assure you is important to your constituents. So Action for Children, I should just mention, is, as Shannon said, the Child Care Resource and Referral Agency for Central Ohio and has been since 1972. And that means that each year we reach about 9,000 parents and early childhood professionals uh, in our region and well over 50,000 children through a variety of services, including help finding childcare, uh, providing home visiting, parent coaching, professional development for teachers, and then technical assistance around quality improvement for programs. We maintain relationships with providers and track data on their circumstances uh, that aligns very much with uh, what Kim suggested was the picture from NACI's survey for in Ohio. Um, I have three things I sort of want to convey. One is that we are in a dire circumstance, Kim, Shannon lined that up really well, and, and that it ultimately comes down to being a math problem that can't be solved at the state house. Um, you know, the temporary pandemic childcare license that Shannon referred to, 
uh, contain some restrictions, some requirements require, because of public health concerns around the virus to tamp down the, the virus, to flatten the curve and, and fight the spread of this, the, the pandemic. And those constraints about teacher-child uh, ratios, about the number of children in a space, about cleaning and disease prevention requirements and so forth, those created a math problem. Uh, too few children are able to be served. Uh, programs are generating too little income and costs have increased. In fact, if you look back to that period when programs were closed, the 400 or so in our region that operated to serve essential workers, one in five of them never served a child or closed up shop because they couldn't make it work financially. So this concern about up to 45% of our supply of childcare going away is a real concern. What we've seen since childcare reopened uh, in June, essentially, is that more programs are coming back, they're operating at reduced capacity, and there's been a slow return of children. Currently, as of uh, last week, uh, providers in, uh, there are about 77% of the pre-pandemic providers in Franklin County are back online. But again, they're not providing the level, the amount of childcare they provided before. In fact, it varies from location to location, but about 40 to 60% of the population of children that were served in the pandemic can now be served in the programs that are open. In our June survey of providers, we found that only 49% of those seats were filled. Now that's improved. More parents are, you know, they're feeling fear for their children, but also fear for their jobs, and they're re-enrolling children in programs. And this month's survey just completed, not yet you know, made public, but shows that child care center enrollment is up to 78%. So that's helpful, but it still creates a constraint since the number of total seats available uh, currently under those necessary public health requirements is still too low for, program, for the business model to be sustainable. Now, the second thing I want to emphasize is that the CARES Act, that came, the aid that came from Washington, it's made a difference. It's just not made enough of a difference. So our data, again, from providers has shown that overwhelmingly, the majority of providers are not able to cover expenses, particularly centers, which represent three out of four childcare programs in our region and host the majority of children. Providers projected deficits for June reached five figures, and there remains a gap, even with the state pandemic support payments that Shannon mentioned at the top of the conversation. Well, so when we talk about this danger of programs closing, this is it. Without these federal resources, we wouldn't have had 77% of programs come back online by July 20th. And in eight days, when this money runs out, we're not going to have that continued expansion. We will likely have the retraction begin then. So more action is needed because the marketplace is not functioning. This is not a sustainable situation. The last thing I want to emphasize is that now is the time for leadership in Washington. The Child Care is Essential Act offers a way forward. That $50 billion investment is not a number just pulled out of the air. Experts have calculated that. It recognizes that child care is not just a business. It's infrastructure that we as a nation and as communities need to invest in. It recognizes that there's no recovery for the wider economy without childcare. Our cities, our citizens don't need federal militia in camouflage. We need federal investments in childcare so children can grow and learn, so parents can go to work, so employers can have a steady workforce and communities can recover. I am so pleased that you signed on to that letter recently. It shows that you have this issue on your radar, and I hope that as you and your staff explore more, you'll also understand and support the expanded federal relief that is needed now. Thank you so much for your time, and I turn this to Shannon and Lee Ann, who will give you more detail. Thanks, Eric, and we put in the chat box a link to your um, survey on the pandemic child care lessons that have been learned from Central Ohio. So the congressmen and those on the um, listening to the webinar can have access to that. Um, and with that, I want to turn it over to Leanne to really now take the systems level and the 
teacher perspective down into the child care center program level. Um, Leanne, why don't you share with the congressman some of the real world, how these things have really translated into your business and what it has meant to the families um, who are depending on this business. Okay, thank you, Congressman, for being here um, and letting me share my experience. Um, again, my name is Leanne Easterling. I'm the director of Mary Evans Child Development Center, and we are located in Columbus. Our center is tuition-based, which means if parents are not paying tuition, we are not bringing in money. We closed in March, and when we closed, we were serving about 75 children. When we reopened for our summer program June 1st, due to the new requirements for keeping staff and children safe, we had to adjust from having a preschool room or a school age class that had 20 children to serving only nine children in each room. And where we used to serve 10 toddlers, we can now only serve six. As we looked at reopening, I was worried that I would have to choose which families would be able to attend with the new ratios. Um, what I wasn't prepared for was how people were how afraid people were to return. There's no good research on the spread of COVID in childcare centers and many families did not return. Because of this, our summer enrollment is down by about a third. And at the same time, we're spending more on cleaning supplies and masks in order to keep children and, and staff safe and healthy. In June, we were able to secure a grant uh, from the state to compensate for some of the loss of enrollment that helped with payroll and supplies. And I just applied for the July grant. Um, my summer enrollment hasn't changed at all, but I'll be receiving less money this time simply because the funding has run out. The good news as we look towards fall is that most of our families are interested in returning. The bad news is that the, the number of children we can serve is still limited. Our typical enrollment is about 75 children for a school year. This year with the rules the way they are, we're only allowed to serve 39. That's almost a 50% reduction in enrollment. And as a tuition-based center, that also means about a 50% loss of income. In order to survive financially, childcare centers are having to think creatively by moving into new spaces, changing staffing models, and possibly sacrificing quality of care. We're trying to serve families who need to return to work and survive as a business at the same time. We have to answer hard questions about increasing tuition costs and adding fees. If we do expand into other spaces, what will the expense be? This is not a business where someone can set up a laptop on a table and have a new office space. We need tables and chairs and cots and toys and oftentimes extra teachers. All of this is an added expense. Will the extra tuition make it worthwhile? What if someone gets sick and what if we have to shut down again? If we have to close a room to quarantine, do we still charge families? If we say yes, they may still have to pay for temporary care while they're at home. This is an added expense for them. If we say no, how do we pay for payroll and other expenses with no tuition coming in? Either way, there are consequences for Ohio workers, whether they are my teachers or employees in other businesses. If childcare centers can't open or can't remain open, how will people return to work? How many young children will be left at home in unsafe conditions? Childcare is on the primary sector section of Responsible Restart Ohio. We were one of the first professions listed. We are essential for people getting back to work and we are on the front lines every day. If we can't survive, not only will 14 teachers be unemployed, but the ripple effect for families and other businesses will be exponential. Thanks so much, Leanne. Um, in just a couple of minutes, you touched on a few of the major challenges that impact the business side of this. And if it impacts the business side of this, it impacts the family and the children side of this. And right. so this is just a really complicated issue in that um, so many uh, small businesses are impacted, um, but it also means uh, so many families and children are also impacted. And without, like we, we all said at the top, without childcare, um, there isn't a, a workforce to support all of the other industries in the state. So with that, um, Congressman, I really wanted to, to, you've been so generous 
us with your time in listening to just a few of the issues and a few of the, the people who've been kind of in the throes of this, but I wanted to give you a chance to either ask them any questions or share your perspective on this issue. Um, the floor is yours. All right, well, well, thank you, Shannon. I appreciate it. Please call me Troy. Um, and, and thank uh, Leanne and, and Eric and, and you all for, for giving me some um, points here. And, and I have taken some notes and obviously my, my staff, Nate and I have been talking about this issue. It's, it's very big. I do want to point out to all of you um, that Leader McCarthy did do a national opt-ed on the need for childcare funding. I, I, if you did not see that, I, I will forward that. It was in USA Today. And I will forward that to Shannon, so all of you have that. So we'll that I, I just- box. We'll put that in the chat box, Congressman. Um, we, we that's have just a reassurance to you all that, look, you are in the conversation. Uh, and, and I think that's important. And obviously, as Eric said, I, I did sign on to the Rodney Davis and, and Tom Emmer letter. And um, you know th this hits me, I don't have a, grandchild yet I have friends that have grandchildren and, and the impact that this has been and I'm I'm hearing they're sharing their stories with me with what their children are going through um, you, you know my daughter-in-law is, is a nurse down at Vanderbilt Hospital and and she's had these conversations with me about the challenges that they face also so uh, one of one of the big things that I really want to talk about Shannon is the PPP and the idol what what were those issues? And if Kimberly and Leanne can talk about that, that would be great. I'd love to know, you know, what happened there. Yeah, so, so um, what, what I can just say from a very high level is um, there are two issues that were in many cases driving this. The first is, is that, you know, when you, when you use the term small business, um, child care doesn't get any smaller of a business, but mm -hmm. there are literally thousands of them in the state of Ohio. And many of them don't have traditional banking relationships like other businesses do. And so to be perfectly honest with you, they were shut out because the banks were communicating with their customers um, and were, were focused on their larger customers, to be honest. The second issue is that, again, because of the size of um, the childcare businesses themselves, the floor was too high for them to even to be able to access it. But it doesn't mean that they didn't need the resources simply because their operational costs were much lower. In fact, we know that that wasn't the case. And so, you know, having to think about um, child care really as an essential industry that requires some special thought would be what I would recommend as you all are considering how um, perhaps some future small business support might roll out because Look, child care is, is as critical infrastructure as our roads and our bridges to this economy. If we didn't know it before, COVID-19 underscored for us how critical of infrastructure it is. And as a result, a piece of this investment in small business um, should look at child care differently. And so that's that would be some of the at the top level. Leanne, I don't know if if you all participated in the PPP or not. And Eric, you might have some perspective to share um, since you deal with providers. I'll I'll just toss it to you to you both. Um, Leanne, would you like to start? Well, I we have a unique situation where we are um, within a church. So the church did apply um, and use that money. I think what's um, important to remember too is, you know, child care was allowed to reopen June 1st, but you know, that March to June portion, the, a lot was spent on keeping people employed. And then we've moved towards the end of the summer and those, that money is running out, but we have a whole school year ahead of us where we're having to operate at 50% capacity with tuition not coming in and so you know it was wonderful 
while it lasted. <laughs> um, but moving forward is the real concern for us. One thing I would add is that childcare is very small, right? Shannon emphasized that. There's centers and there are also family childcare homes. And they play a really crucial role, especially in odd hour care. Uh, they tend to be also disproportionately African-American owned or people of color owned. And so they're really crucial in their communities. And they have less of a traditional relationship with banks, otherwise also isolated in, in a way that some other businesses are not. And so what we found is that only about one out of four family child care providers applied for a loan, as opposed to uh, just shy of two thirds of centers. And the approval rates were similarly off balance. So um, when we think about the investment that needs to be made in childcare, it can't simply be leaving it up to people to go into debt, even if the debt is partially refundable. There has to be some greater investment that offsets those constraints that are required for the public health emergency. Can I add just quickly um, from some of the information, Congressman Balderson, we have been holding weekly conversations with providers throughout this to help them navigate all the challenges. And we're a small association as far as, I mean, we have over 2,000 members, but we only have four staff members ourselves. So we applied for the PPP loan as well because a major source of our revenue was gone. And I'll tell you, it was challenging. If we didn't have an accounting firm that could help me gather all this information, understand all the requirements, I'm not sure I would have gotten through the process. And so then you have these small business owners who many of them did reopen as pandemic centers and were trying to navigate all of that and operate in crisis while trying to figure out how to apply for the PPP loans. That was a challenge. One of, this is anecdotal, but some of the stories that we heard of why there's such a, the large centers receiving so many more of the loans was simply a capacity issue. They had structures in place and staffing in place to navigate the process. And so I think that, you know, if there are additional loans that are coming or grants or whatever, anything that can streamline the process for them and um, support, whether it's through small business sites, I know SCORE, provided some support, but people need to be aware of those and connected to those. And I, I think that was part of the reason is they just didn't have the infrastructure in place to navigate the process. And, and Kim, you bring up a great point and that that happened with small business owners also. Um, the, the typical traditional um, small business that has some, as you know, it's great how Shannon used that, but they have some infrastructure in place um, I, I would probably say that over 90, low 90% of the people did have to incorporate and bring their CPA or their accountant or the business bookkeeper into the uh, piece of, of, of applying for that PPP or, or the EIDL program. Um, so that, that's just good to know that, um, you know, it, it's a matter of, of funding and, and, and not necessarily, you know, applying, you know, obviously your the tasks are different and um, you know, we need to adjust to that uh, to, to the best of our ability so you can continue doing what you you are doing. And um, we're blessed to have you all doing what you do. We're, we're very thankful and, and we know um, you are uh, a top priority just because of the economy. I mean, you, you're, you're going to be uh, a major piece of this economy getting back up again and, as we move forward and continue to move forward. So, um, I, I still want to, and we'll do a little bit of stuff offline too, Kim, to kind of talk about some stuff um, with, with that. The, the other thing that I do want to mention that is out there, um, and I was very fortunate last Friday, um, the Small Business Committee had the opportunity to have uh, Treasury Secretary Mr. Mnuchin uh, and the SBA Administrator um, in our committee. I, I took the opportunity to have that and, and I flew over here last Friday in the morning and um, but I wanted to talk to him about some things that um, some ideas that we had and one of those ideas that he took to and I've actually seen it on national TV now uh, on Squawk Pox is a PPE tax credit 
up to $25,000. Um, we're working really hard. Uh, Mrs. Lawrence, Congresswoman Lawrence and I um, have done that uh, as a bipartisan effort. So it, it's, we've got it on the table and, and I cornered Mr. Mnuchin on that. I should, corner might be a wrong word, but just really emphasize to him if that's something that he would at least consider in this next package also for businesses that can get apply for tax credits up to $25,000, as I said, for their PPE. I, I do know that's a large expense. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll get that information out there to all of you also, Shannon. Great. Um, thank you for, for doing that. And um, just to you and, and Nate and others on your staff, right now we have um, providers there's almost 200 people in your district who care about early childhood and the child care that is really foundational to early childhood um, on the line. And they're putting their experiences in the chat box. And I want to encourage them to do that. And we will compile all that for you, for you uh, Congressman, and we'll share it with you so you can read the stories of the people who are impacted by these, um, you know, these decisions in, in a very real way. So I want to encourage folks who are listening in to um, please keep sharing your stories because we'll make sure we, we get them to the Congressman so he's um, can see the, the impacts, it, it really matters. Um, Congressman, in addition to the um, USA Today op-ed that we put in the chat box, we did put a um, link to the letter that um, you had signed um, with a series of, of colleagues. Would you wanna just share with the group um, kind of your thoughts about that? Sure can. The, um, the letter was with Rodney Davis um, and, and uh, Congressman Tom Emmer. Uh, Tom is in, located in Minnesota and, and Rodney is actually located in Springfield, um, Illinois, uh, is the congressman. And it's, what it does is it just, it, in this upcoming, it, it just wants to make sure, and, and as I said earlier with, with Leader McCarthy, um, that you all are in the conversation with the next package. And look, I will share with you all this morning, uh, there is, they're working on the package. Uh, Mr. Mnuchin was on the Capitol yesterday. I actually happened to see him uh, walking around. So he was meeting uh, with the leadership of uh, Speaker Pelosi and uh, Mr. McConnell. So it is happening. Uh, tentatively this morning, they said there is an agreement coming out of the Senate. Uh, so don't go run to the press yet. That's not, I mean, that's just things that are happening and we got a ways to go yet, obviously. Uh, so that, that's the main thing. And, you know, I, I just, and I'm gonna to continue to emphasize to the importance of what it means for you all uh, to do what you're doing to, as I said earlier to Kimberly and, and everybody about getting this economy going. And that's, that's what this letter is about. It, it's just trying to convey that message out there that we need to do of, of the importance. And, and Shannon said, a lot of you are gonna send in um, some thoughts or suggestions. Please do, I encourage you to, I, I promise you, um, we really do look at those um, because it's important. Uh, and, and these are things that, you know, I, I'm on the Small Business Committee. Uh, the Small Business Committee under normal circumstances is very quiet, uh, but having, dealt with this pandemic, it has become one of the busiest committees um, that, that's in Congress right now. And I feel honored to do that. We have two Ohioans. I can't encourage you enough. Ranking member of Small Business Committee is, is Congressman Shabbat uh, of the Cincinnati Hamilton County area. And I, I know that Senator Jones knows exactly who that is uh, since she formerly worked for him. Uh, but many moons you know, ago. <laughs> he, he, he's very engaged in this also. And, and um, he, he, here's the good piece with this. The Small Business Committee truly, truly is bipartisan. It, it has to be. And, you know, I want to reassure all of you, there will be a package. We will agree to it. Congress can do this. I, I know that what you see on the national TV and, you know, please take that with some, you know, grain of salt. I don't, I don't know what word to use, but 
Um, we do function. We, we've gotten several packages out to now out to date. Uh, and, and we will get this package moving forward. And it's, it's just, I can't encourage all of you enough to, you know, reach out to us and reach out to your, your congressman, wherever you're located, but don't, don't feel like you got to find your congressman or, I mean, get it to us or, or Congressman Chabot. Um, so we can get this on the, in the small business committee. Um, you know, the, the Madam Chair, she is, she's a the chairwoman out of New York. Um, also gets it. Her state is, I mean, she's right in Manhattan, so she understands the impact that it's having on New York, too. So, um. Well, thank you for that. Um, we, we, we know that um, right now, as uh, families and communities are preparing for schools to open back up, um, that that has taken a lot of focus away from childcare. And it really shouldn't because um, childcare are the schools for our youngest and most vulnerable children. Half of the children that are in, um, in our childcare system are under five and we're very concerned about you know, uh, infants and toddlers in particular. But half of the children that are in our child care system are school age children. And so all of the issues that we are seeing talked about in the public domain now about schools, the traditional K-12 schools, also applies to the child care settings. And um, you know, so so we appreciate you taking some time to really you know, try to keep childcare in this conversation because it is the first school for children. It is the before school and after school care for our children. It is inextricably linked to our K-12 system. And so your support is, is greatly appreciated. And with that, I wanna be super mindful of your time and just thought I would I would ask you one last question. You've, you've shared your thoughts from the small business um, perspective. I'm wondering for those of um, who are on the line listening to this, what can we do to help you carry this message to your colleagues um, to make sure childcare um, is sufficiently supported uh, in the United States Congress? What advice do you have for us? The, the best advice, um, Shannon looked, I, I take this role very, very seriously, obviously, but you know, the reason I'm saying that is it's because we're customer service. I mean, we are, our, our number one priority in this office, whether it's the district office in Worthington, Ohio, or whether it's, it, it's here in DC is, is to make sure that we provide. Um, I need everyone to communicate with us. Um, I have one phenomenal staff uh, and, and you all need to know this that are in the district. Uh, my chief of staff is, is Terry Geiger. Uh, Terry is in the district office. So I, I, I can encourage all of you. Sorry about that. House is getting recession for votes. Um, the, but, but Terry is in the district office. Um, and, and I'll get that contact information for you there. Um, and Look, she gets it too. Um, she, she knows the, the importance of childcare um, and, and what you all do. I mean, look, these kids, I mean, people don't think about this. I, 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 maybe they do and I just don't know, but you guys are raising these kids. I mean, as toddlers and, and I mean, you're the first contact that they're gonna have as adults and in, in the process that they're gonna go through. And I think it's important that, you know, we spread that message of the importance it is that you all provide this necessity. I apologize again. I don't know why it keeps going, but uh, <laughs> hang in there, everybody. It, it'll be done here in a minute. Uh, if you want me to uh, meet, give me a thumbs up, Shannon. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> so just thank you, thank you, thank you so much for what you do. Um, you know, email us, Nate. Nate is actually sitting here with me right now. Uh, Nate is from the district. Uh, his parents still live in the district. Uh, well, I guess on the outskirts, so I, they're not Arlington, but um, just, you know, we're, we're here for everyone and, and we want you to communicate. Uh, we'll, we're in Mount Gilead. Uh, 
a lot. We were in Mario County two weeks ago. So anytime I, I, I should, we make, we'll make arrangements to stop up there uh, and, 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 you know, see a facility uh, that, that's up there. So uh, thank you all again very much for what you do and stay safe and healthy and, um, you know, we'll get through this. Well, with that, to, for whom the bell tolls, Congressman, I think that bell is tolling for you um, right on cue. Um, but once again, on behalf of Groundwork and all of our partners who uh, are on this panel uh, and listening in today, thank you for your time. Thanking, thank, you. thank you for helping us save childcare. And to those listening uh, today, uh, you heard the congressman. He said to keep communicating with members. Um, in the chat box is a link to Voter Voice for a way for you to do that. Um, and so we encourage you to do that today. And um, we will uh, pass along all the comments to the congressman so Nate and his team has them. So thank you, congressman. We look forward to seeing you in the district soon. Thank you very much, Shannon. Good seeing you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.